Previously on True Future Israel. This can change the way cancer is treated. The catheters eventually stop moving forward. I can Game Boy this in a much more effective fashion. Medics is very unique. Fail fast or succeed big. Pretty cinematic day. Well, I mean, this is, like, you can't ask for better than this. Today I'm on the Western Wall with Mishi Harmon at one of the holiest spots in the world. If you just look around, there's probably people here from 30, 40 different countries, you know, speaking 30 or 40 different languages. And this activity is 365 days a year? Absolutely. On Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the year in the Jewish calendar, you'll see there's, you know, tens and tens of thousands of people. You can't move here. It's like, you know, I don't know, Miami Beach on, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, what <laughs> the, some rave music. <laughs> right, right, right. The number of activities going on around me right now are insane. Got music celebrations here. Bar Mitzvah happening here. Mazal Tov! Look at the woman sort of trying over, to peer over, over, the over, wall. Yeah, over the wall. As you said, they gave birth to those. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Boys and they can't yeah, participate. Engage. Yeah, participate. Right. Being at the wall, I feel torn between the rational engineer in me as it's only a location somewhere on planet Earth. You see all of these notes in the wall, which is a tradition that's developed over the last few centuries of people sort of writing these little requests of God, basically, and putting it in one of the crevices. Yet, the romantic in me is overwhelmed with the history and the homage that is paid to this 100 meter by 100 meter spot on planet Earth. I'm in the school of, I don't think I have to go to a place right. to have faith. Seems right it could to be me. any place, but it's not the significance of the history's not lost on me. For sure. But just by touching it, you can feel the significance because they're so uh, smooth from all these hands. So this has been worn down by... Yeah. Generations of generations of hopers and prayers and truth seekers. One of the most amazing stories that we've come across is a story that happened right here. I love storytellers. And what I love about them is the respect by which they paint their picture. And Mishi approaches storytelling entirely different than I do. So in 1967, there was a war here called the Six Day War. During six days of war, Israel tripled its territory, uh, conquering the Sinai um, and all of the West Bank and the Golan Heights. But at the time, in 1967, the Kotel looked entirely different. From here all the way on, there was a neighborhood houses, a Palestinian neighborhood called Shkunata Mugrabin. And this 22-year-old commander, Abi Levi, arrived with his soldiers at the Kotel. And it was the middle of the war. 36 hours beforehand, they had been all involved in this very bloody battle. And then out of nowhere, he hears two little kids coming out of one of the houses and yelling, Doctor! 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 And they follow these two toddlers into the bowels of this, uh, of this neighborhood to their shack. And there, A.B. and the doctor see the kid's mother in the middle of giving birth. And these Israeli soldiers in the middle of the war help this Palestinian woman give birth to a little baby girl right sure. here. And they run back to the Western Wall, and the war continues. So the minute I heard this story, we went on a uh, all-out operation to find the baby who was born here. We were looking all over the country for her, and ultimately I went on national radio and I told this story, and I asked the public to help me find this woman. And then one guy sent us a link to a blog post and said, look into this woman. I have a feeling she might be related to the story that you're looking into. And I called this woman, uh, and, and completely out of the blue, and I said, are you by any chance the baby that was born at the Western Wall in the middle of the Six Day War in 1967? And then there was sort of silence on the line for a second. And she said, yes, I am. 
And I was like nearly crying because this was after a year of looking for this woman. I couldn't believe that we had finally arrived. And I found her and it was super interesting because it turned out this girl grew up as a Jew and basically now is in denial of being an Arab. And we, uh, we brought all of the people involved. The officer who was present at the birth, we brought them right here. What were the emotions that day when everybody got together? It was interesting. For some, it was this kind of cathartic moment of nostalgia, especially for the officer. <laughs> That was for him. For her, it was much more complicated, I think, because it forced her to confront part of her identity, which she's done her utmost to suppress. Because in Israel, things in many ways are still very much black and white. There isn't some, like a porous overlap between the two. But of course, in reality, there is. That's uh, an amazing story. And the fact that yeah. you were able to just serendipitously find her. Is yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. So if there's one thing that Israel has is an insane commitment. And whether it's their commitment to telling a story or their commitment to belief, or their commitment to technology. This country of eight million people went all chips in on technology. The robotics industry in Israel is incredibly robust. So much technology comes out of this country. We have no other choice. You don't have oil. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Professor Moshe's royalty. A royalty certainly within the technology world as it applies to Israel and medical device. He's been at the starting point, the genesis, of nearly every robotic platform that's come out of this country. I'm a mechanical engineer by, by education. So I knew very little about what is called the registration, medical imaging, things like that. And the registration is actually, you probably know, but you have to take the robot, the patient, and the imaging on the same coordinate. Mm -hmm. Because you take the picture here on the city, you plan on a city, and then you have to tell the robot Please do it on the patient that's sitting right over there. Mm -hmm. So this was a problem of registration, medical imaging. But when I looked at many conferences, many papers, they said this problem is solved. But it was not solved, I can tell you. Totally not. Because once you come into the operating room, you have, you know, you have big person, small person. And there is totally, there are several kinds of machines that does the, that does the x ray, mm -hmm. and several technicians. And uh, you have to get results more than 90% successful in each time. Accuracy is needed very, very much. So what happened actually, what we did, we established here in Mazor a group of, uh, of medical imaging and we, we spent a lot of time on that. And right now the main, I should say, the main assets of Mazor is not only robotics, but also the medical imaging stuff. The imaging takes place at a couple times <clears throat> in the interaction with the patient, right? You have the original CT scan, and that happens when they're on the table as well, correct? That's correct. Yeah. The way that we work is as follows. You have a CT scan. The surgeon plan on the CT scan what he wants to do, where the, he wants the pedicle screw to be inserted. And then in the operating room, we take two X-ray images, and then these images we compare to what we take preoperatively. And this is how we put the person and the robot at the same line as... So they can sync up. Right. What can you show us today about Mazor? The robot here in Mazor is called semi-automatic robot. Why semi? Because it actually shows you where to go. And you can see it over here. For example, if you would like to insert the medical screws right here, mm -hmm. what the robot does now is moves and directs you along the trajectory that was pre-planned mm -hmm. on the city. Mm -hmm. But the robot itself doesn't, do, doesn't actually insert the screws. We can take the pre-op image, and then we can take the intraoperative image, yes. and then the robot will then be programmed to go along the path right. that it's recommending based upon numerous points of data, and gives guidance right. and recommendations to the surgeon That's correct. for an approach. Right. But the surgeon is still deciding based upon their training and protocol right. and their instincts. Right? So we're taking that cognitive load off that surgeon That's and correct. giving them advisement. And then he or she is driving the screw. Right. 
we could design it to do that. Mm -hmm. But we thought it's going to be too much of a step for a surgeon to, to, to get, give up that control. To give up that control. And next step, people get more confidence with the systems. Robots will go to be automatic, completely autonomous, completely. This is what I think. I don't think robotics will replace surgeons. Right. But I think surgeons who use robots will replace surgeons who this don't. This is, I agree 100% with you. Do you think that robotics are being taken to another step that people will be uncomfortable with? Most people's interpretation of robotics is what they see in the movies, coming to take over the world. Hmm. In the robotics suite, it's different. I totally would be operated on by a robot. I don't want my surgeon to have a bad Monday morning after a weekend banger and a hangover and his hands are shaking. My robot has no feelings. Give me a robot. Next time on True Future, Israel. These are not tools you would see in a hospital setting. <laughs> so, uh, good. Why do they put down their differences here? Yet when they walk out the door, things change. Mm -hmm.